Well, Greg, how did how does your book been going? Uh, the last I knew of it, I gave you a little blurb to to use. I don't know whether you used it or not, but uh, I hope it uh, went off well and has been doing well. Oh yes, I did use it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's on the book, in fact, the the, the published one. So um, yeah, the book's been doing very well. Um, yeah, I, I think the book's uh, taken a, a different angle because it's uh, coming from quite a scientific angle, but is also very practical and and taking that kind of approach. And I think a lot of people have responded very positively to that. And and I think that's really where our work has a has a connection because you also take a scientific angle on the whole area of exploring these kinds of things so but i think in many ways i'm coming from maybe looking more at the parapsychology and you're looking more at the physics so i think um they're kind of two converging areas in a way one uh, gathering the data that supports the the larger model and the other actually developing and working out the larger model yeah when i uh um read your book uh, I was real pleased to see that it was uh, very straightforward, not a lot of, uh, of uh, theorizing, but it was more of the fact of here's what I've experienced, here's what it seems to mean, and you know, present it. And uh, that reminded me a whole lot of Bob Monroe's book. You know, Bob's, Bob's book was written almost like a diary. You know, here were my experiences, and uh, here's, here's what I think they mean. And I think that's a very useful thing to do for people and uh, I was pleased to see that you had uh, that you were kind of giving a modern uh, update to that, uh, that body of literature and that I thought it would be a, a, a real useful book to a lot of people trying to uh, deal with this phenomena called out of body. Now in my own work um, you're right I have like a, a bigger picture out of body is just one thing one set of phenomena in a much larger picture that deals with, with more than that. It deals with the larger consciousness system, uh, but not just our ability to explore it, but what does it mean? You know, what does it have to do with us and our physical reality? How does it connect to science? Uh, you know, what is its implications for our attitudes toward life and our purpose and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a, a bigger picture of the whole thing with, um, Things like remote viewing and out of body and lucid dreaming, just being, um, you know, facts of the process. You know, just thing, things you can do as consciousness that are available to anyone to uh, experience if they practice and uh, if they can get their their ego and their uh, you know, their fears out of the way, then uh, that sort of thing is available. And I, I. Uh, in my in my talks, I explain to people about experiencing the uh, larger conscious system because I think it's a it's a good way for them to get firsthand experience about the larger reality. And you know, I keep telling everybody, "Oh, don't take my word for it. You have to go get your own experience." And then I feel obligated to give them some avenue of how to do that. And uh, I talk to them about how to deal with their intent. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, and remote viewing and then out of body because all those are relatively, you know, easy things to do if you, if you work at them for a while and, and uh, take them seriously. So it is, it is still on my list of things to talk about because it's one of those avenues that people can get firsthand evidential information about the fact that there is a larger consciousness system and we are consciousness and we can get around in it and we can experience reality from a much bigger perspective than just this physical perspective. So that's well, kind of I, where I'm still tied into the out of body. Well I think that's that's true. I think I see it as an access route. I think I see the out of body experiences. No, I'm trouble hearing. I got a very low volume on that thing now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay. Um yeah I, I see it as an access route. I see it as a as a way for people to directly experience that aspect of themselves and do 
uh, maybe explore what is out there in terms of the, the larger reality. I think the the out of body experience is one of the best avenues because it's a it's a direct uh, way to encounter that um, form of consciousness, if you like. Whereas if if you were if you were to just focus on meditation or just focus on remote viewing or something like that, I think you're experiencing then just a small element of it. Whereas I think with the out of body experience, if you if you take it to its natural conclusion in a way, I think that it does connect you to this uh, larger interconnected awareness. Um, actually, in my first book, Avenues of the Human Spirit, I talked more about the effect and the impact that my out-of-body experiences have had on me and how they um, led me more towards looking at compassion and um, more of the, mm-hmm. the things that we generally understand as a spiritual understandings of the world. So I think through the out-of-body experience, I directly encountered this interconnectedness this sense that we're not separate from from everything else, and by experiencing that directly through the through the OBE, I I then found that changes would happen in my everyday life, and I would start to become more and more engaged in in a more positive, if you like, way of living my life. So I, I think that's really the the potential and the the impact that the experience can have. Yeah. I agree with that, and I've had the same uh, the same set of experiences. Uh, when I first went out to um, Bob Monroe's uh, laboratory to do work and uh, uh, to learn about out of body, I wasn't going out there with an idea that I was going to uh, you know grow spiritually. That wasn't that wasn't the direction. I was a physicist, and I was going to go out there to explore another part of reality. You know, that's where I was coming from, and uh, But as you explore that other reality and get to understand it and get to uh, kind of see your place in a larger picture, then the spiritual part of it just kind of happens all by itself. It's just a natural part of becoming a part of that bigger picture of seeing it. You don't see yourself in the same way anymore once your your viewpoint uh, expands. And you know, it's really no different than uh, traveling any place else. You know, people who are well traveled have a bigger perspective on you know, life and, and uh, the world than they had if they never left home. You know, those people who never ventured, say, more than 20 miles from where they were born have a very parochial view of things. And uh, those who have traveled the world have a much bigger picture and it affects everything they do. All of their life is, is informed by this greater uh, understanding of the way things are and then when you go into an out-of-body reality you just it's the same thing all over again you know once you you've traveled in these larger spaces you become a larger uh, person you become uh, more uh, I don't know I guess your, your perspective becomes more integrated with the with the whole and you see all the connectedness between individuals and, and everything else and you're you're part of that connectedness, and then the spiritual dimension just starts to happen and just starts to grow. And then eventually, at least with me and I think with many people, the spiritual dimension begins to become the bigger part of it. And it's not just the experiences, but uh, the why of the experiences, the, the um, you know, what can you learn from it? How can you grow? How can you develop yourself? And eventually, for me anyway, the actual experiences of uh, of the out of body or in the larger consciousness system became not so special. They're just every day. It's just like life. You know, it's it's not a, a thing that I go do. It's a thing that I just live all the time. And if there's something in the non-physical that I need information or experience or something, then I'm there in a second and and have it and back in another second, actually less than a second. And it's just a part of my everyday existence rather than a special thing that I go and I get in a special position and I lie down and I play, you know, binaural beats and I go through this, this, uh, process to go, you know, out of body. I just kind of live in the bigger reality all the time. And it's always there and always has an access. It's just a shift of, of focus. So now the point isn't so much exploring. As it is, of course, I've done that for, you know, close to 40 years. So, 
you know, it, uh, you know, it's not like a, somebody who's just starting that has a lot to explore, but uh, I've done a lot of exploring, so I don't actually have that need to, to press on in the new places quite so much as I, as I do to just understand how it all works. You know, why is it like that? What, uh, you know, what is it that I can tell others that would be useful to them, you know, about this larger reality? That sort of thing. So then the spiritual part begins to be the much bigger part and the experiential part begins to be just another tool, just like it is in this physical reality. You know, you interact with beings, you gather information, you process the information, you share the information. And now I do that in just a larger reality frame. Don't, don't you think there's a there, there's a degree to it though of these kind of peak experiences or these experiences that take you into a, a deeper understanding or a deeper apprehension of some of those kinds of ideas that maybe through looking closely at those types of experiences and the actual phenomenology of the experience actually give us clues to what that bigger system is to how that system might work. I mean, where would you say your, where would you say your model, your model arose from? Did it, didn't it arise from looking closely at the, at the structure of those experiences? Yes, that's exactly what I did for 35 years before I got to the point that I thought I knew enough to sit down and write something. You know, it's exactly what you say. You can, you can do, uh, you can do physics there. You can, you can go back to the same you know, the same connections, the same places, and just change one variable and see what how that changes your experience and then go change another variable. And eventually, just as you described, um, you begin to understand the bigger picture just from the sum total of all of your experiences there and also how they connect to this reality. What's the what's the connection? Why? Um, you know, how does it how does it all together, things like synchronicity and other things that are kind of connections between these reality frames. Um, yeah, you're right. That's that's the point. That's where I got my theory from was because of my experience in the larger conscious system and ability to, to take that experience and understand it in a logical way. That That's the whole thing, but that took me a lot of time. I wasn't a quick study. <laughs> That's, you know, 35 years or so before the light bulb went on enough for me to, like I say, to write it, to write it down before it made, made some kind of coherent sense because I had like little pockets of understanding. I understood this piece and under, I experienced that piece and a lot of pieces just as you have. And I didn't really have a way to tie them all together into one, you know, part of one process. And then eventually that came that came too, but if I hadn't had the larger consciousness system in, other, in, in order to experiment and experience in, I never would have come up with the ideas in my big dog. That was the difference between me, I think, and other physicists who are out there trying to think big thoughts, is I had the ability to explore those big thoughts in the larger dimension. And that was the that was the key. Otherwise, I don't think I ever could have come to the conclusions I came to without having that experience. So the out of body experience, or we just say the experience of the larger conscious system, was a critical element in my evolution to you know where I am today and the books that I've written and that sort of thing. I couldn't have done it without it. It's an integral part of it. Very useful, essential to my evolving understanding. Mm -hmm. Tom, well, I, I, uh, Tom, earlier you mentioned binaural beats, and uh, uh, most of us are, are familiar with the technology and how it came about and how it morphed into what is now called hemisync. Uh, Graham has a, a, a very interesting and different approach to audio technology that does not use binaural beats. Uh, Graham, could you please tell us about, about it? Um, well, back in the... In the uh, late 90s. Um, I've been having out of body experiences for about 30 years now. So um, when I when I started to look into technology in order to help induce the, the, the experience, I started working with large scale structures, 
Um, I had a background in technology and also a background in the arts. So I, I used virtual reality. I used large scale structures that place the participant within the structure to, to help create a, an altered state. Um, I also worked with hypnosis and things like that. And I started to work with um, sound as a part of that. So it's a multi-sensory approach, really, um, using all of the senses to try and induce some kind of uh, different state of awareness for the participant. Um, and what I found was I, I went off in a slightly different direction with the binaural beats. I didn't find that binaural beats had a particular effect on me, really. And uh, I, I wanted to see if I could uh, reach a different kind of state and I started to, to work more with the vibrational state. So my my technology is all aimed at getting to the vibrational state, which I'm sure most people will be familiar as the most common, what I call transitional stage, the, the sort of mm -hmm. sign that there's a transition taking place. I think there's many others, the void state, for example, kind of um, womb-like, dark uh, environment that's not negative in any way, but just feels like being um, in between conscious and unconscious, um, also uh, noises and vibration sounds and things like that. So, um, but my technology is aimed at those sort of transitional stages because I think that um, once you can get to that point, or, or most people maybe find it easier to get to that point, and then from that point, it's then an easier step to go um, to the next level, if you like. So. That's been my kind of approach. Um, I don't know, if, Tom, if you've seen any of my structures. Yes. Um, Wasn't it inspired by flotation tanks? Um, they were. Flotation was was part of the uh, part of the inspiration. I looked at many different areas. I looked at um, the research of John Zubek, um, who who basically did fifteen years of research into sensory deprivation. So I would say that sensory deprivation in general and perceptual deprivation were the things that primarily were interesting me in the in the late 90s. So I was bringing together those kinds of elements. I was looking at what being in those kinds of deep sensory deprivation states, what kind of thing effects they would have on, on the person in that state. And there's a point where it can be very, very beneficial, but there's also a point where it can become very uncomfortable and un unpleasant, and I wanted to try and find a way to bring it, to bring that into the, the positive point that would lead to transcendent type experiences. Um, so that's really how the technology came about. I worked on it um, using very, very low level frequencies. And initially, there's some research that suggests um, different states can be brought about by infrasound. So I started to experiment with infra infrasound initially um, and then moved into combining some of the hypnosis approaches. So it's a, it's a combination of different approaches, really, the, the sound work that I did. But I understand, Tom, when you were initially going to the Monroe Institute, you didn't just look at binaural beats. You were experimenting with all sorts of different things initially. Uh, Absolutely. Experiment with everything. I mean, we just were looking for something that would work. <laughs> you know, uh, that was that was the primary thing, and uh, yes, we did lots of things. It wasn't until we got to the to the binaural beat that we actually found something that was consistent, the uh, that would work for other people. At that point, Dennis and I really didn't need any any help, and but we were trying to find something that other people could use. And of course, we put the binaural beat at four hertz because that was the vibration state. So it, you know, the binaural beats actually focused on the vibration state as well because that was what Bob recorded, that you mm -hmm. have these vibration states. Of course, Dennis and I working together, we all experienced the vibration states too. And yeah, they were around uh, four hertz um, much of the time. They were sometimes very different, but they typically had that as a, as a commonality, that uh, the four hertz kind of shaking. I think and mine was more. Sorry, I was just going to say I think mine were more around seven hertz. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably true. It's, it's different for a lot of people. But anyway, technology is is a tool, and whatever works is a good tool. <laughs> whatever doesn't work is not a good tool. 
So if you can, it, you know, it has more to do with people's attitudes and the way people's psychology, the way they come to the experience has more to do with it than anything else. And often the tools are just to help that psychology be in the right space, just to kind of get them in the right um, mindset for launch, if you will, into this uh, experience. Because if they don't have the right mindset, then no matter what the technology is, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to blast you there unless you're you're doing drugs or something. Then uh, that's just a, you know, it's like shot up in a bottle rocket. You know, you uh, you go there instantly. But if you're doing it on your own, then whatever technology works for you is a good technology. And uh, we, Dennis and I, looked at things like using lights rather than sound. Um, doing uh, strobe at various frequencies, and that was some effective. It wasn't as easy to introduce to people. All you need is a headset and a, you know and an audio line to give them uh, audio, and uh, the lights were a lot more problematic and expensive. And so we didn't work too much with that at the time. But there's lots of different things you can do, and it sounds like the, the things that you have assembled have taken some of the you know some of the most um, Effective things like the sensory deprivation, all that does is basically takes away your input. You no longer have the physical reality input. Well, that's one of the big steps is to let that input go. Well, it's easier to let go when you're in a sensory deprivation tank. Now, letting go of the sensory data becomes trivial because the bank is doing that for you. So it's all of these tools just help people get in a state of being open getting their ego out of the way, getting their fear out of the way, and just existing, being, and open, I guess is the best way I can say, and then things start to happen. But I agree with you, too, uh, what you said earlier, Graham, and that is, for me, the, the meditation is just, or whatever tools that we, that we use to get into a, a good state is just the doorway. When you get in that, what I call point consciousness state, you mentioned the void state, they're probably similar, where you're just a point of consciousness floating in the void. You, know, you have no input of any sort. You are just experiencing yourself as consciousness. That to me is the doorway. That's where you start. You know, that's the beginning. From there, the question is, what, what would you like to do? Where would you like to go? Um, you know, what is your, what is your purpose here today? That sort of thing. But uh, the, the point consciousness state, for some, and in some practices, that's an end point. You spend your life getting to where you can get to that point conscious state and then just stay there and uh, kind of be in that state of deep meditation where all of your sense data is gone. But uh, yeah, the next thing is, well, what do you want to do? Where do you go from here? And uh, that's when it gets more, that's when the fun starts. That's when you begin to explore that space. And that's, I think, an important part of it. Uh, I have, I, I just want to say, interject, I have personally experimented with Graham's technology and most definitely had favorite results with it. And incidentally, yeah. early on, Tom, you brought up, uh, so you made some comment about uh, hallucinogenics. I'd just be curious to hear, what, what is your, Opinion on a gram, or what do you? Um, what is your take on this? I I've actually gone the route of um, not using anything. I I don't even drink alcohol. Or I I'm vegan. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't take any sort of substance whatsoever, and I never have. So my whole approach has been about doing it in terms of what Tom was was alluding to with the whole idea of. Um, I think all spiritual practices throughout history have had this idea of uh, taking away the sensory information, going into meditation to shut down the, the chatter of the mind, to do a vision quest, to um, even things like pain and um, discomfort in terms of uh, doing a kind of more shamanic type process. These are all ways to um, single point consciousness, as, as you say, um, this kind of idea of being in a in a very very focused reduced down awareness which then allows everything else to to flow through so i, I think that's uh, that's really the aim of all of these kinds of practices and i think in many ways 
what we're dealing with now is almost like these technologies that we're talking about are a way of creating almost like a modern temple or a modern uh, spiritual space or a modern uh, consciousness exploration environment. You know, it, it's I think that's what my structures are for. That's what the virtual reality that I've created is based around or even the sensory deprivation. It's taking those practices that we can see in a, in a temple. If you look at a, a cathedral or a temple or anywhere in the world, they all it's it's an immersive multi-sensory environment. You walk in, you have smell from incense, you have sound from music, you have stained glass or beautiful frescoes. It's that the whole um, design, the whole structure of the building, everything about it is to create this immersive experience for the person uh, entering that space. And I think that in in many ways we're, we're trying to get to something like that, but maybe without all of the uh, dogma and the trappings of, of many of the religious traditions and, and distilling it down to its essence in some way. Um, yeah, but back to the um, the question of uh, substances and things like that, I, I guess uh, um, I haven't got much to, to say on that because I have generally, I'm, I'm, I don't have a kind of negative attitude towards it, I should point that out. I'm not saying that other people shouldn't uh, walk that path, but it's just not been the personal avenue that I, I've wanted to take. Yeah, I agree with that uh, entirely. Uh, I'm, I'm with you, you know. I don't, I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke, you know, I don't drink coffee, I don't take caffeine, I don't do any of those things. And the reason that I so I did them all very much in moderation before I started doing this work at the Edinburgh Laboratory. I would drink a beer with guys. I would, uh, you know, I didn't smoke. I guess I did it for a short period of time when I was in college. But anyway, uh, I found that these things affected the clarity of my consciousness. I could tell when I ate food that had preservatives in it or that had sugar in it that my consciousness would start to cloud. And, uh, or if you drink alcohol, your consciousness starts to cloud. And that I didn't like. I wanted my consciousness to, to be as crystal clear and steady and stable as it could be. And here I was going out to Monroe Laboratories trying to study consciousness. And when I went out there with my own consciousness in a fog, I wasn't going to learn much. You know, it would be, uh, I wouldn't be cooperating with what it was I was trying to do. So it was at that point that um, I was connected with Monroe in the early 70s, 1972, I guess, 1971. Maybe we started 72 up through um, almost all of the 70s, I guess I was connected there. But uh, that just would have been an interference with the still, quiet, clear consciousness that I was working with. So I let all that stuff go. And again, that doesn't bother me that other people want to do that. That's their choice. But uh, I've, I've recently um, talked to probably a dozen or more people who have also let go of sugar and preservatives and those sorts of things that affected my consciousness, and they tell me the same story. They mm -hmm. say that, uh, you know, after being off of those things for, you know, four or five months, they noticed a huge difference. And if then they... they uh, ended up with some of those substances by, you know, mistake or accident while they could really tell that, you know, their mind was clouding over when they when they uh, had them. So I don't think it was just me that I was unique in that way. I think most people, unfortunately, with the way we eat and uh, drink in our Western culture, we walk around with very foggy minds and foggy consciousness all the time, and that's part of the problem people have with the meditation without a body. Their mind isn't really clear. And they've been foggy all their life from when they were, you know, one year old and got that, that cake with the icing on it with the one candle on it put in front of them, you know, and they've been, uh, you know, addicted to sugar and eating normal Western foods ever since then. And that's part of the problem. Now, it's not that you can't meditate and can't go out of body while doing those things. You can. It's just so much easier and clearer and simpler if you don't have a, you know, a foggy mind. Um, you know, Bob Monroe is a good example of that. You know, Bob Monroe was a was a uh, 
um, a junk food junkie. You know, he ate cookies and and uh, you know he snacked his way. He was overweight. He uh, did not eat uh, in any kind of a, a particularly healthy or restricted diet. You know, he was uh, he was into snacks and uh, it didn't affect his ability. You know, at all. But then most people are not Bob Monroe. You know, they uh, they don't have that ability to work through those those sorts of things. I found that, it that's as a, the point a major I use. effect for me. Yeah, that's the point I usually make um, to people that, that that I think that these things haven't affected many of the authors who are writing about these things out there. But I think when you're dealing with someone who's maybe never had an experience. And they're trying to get that advantage. They're trying to get those few percent advantage from from each of the choices that they can make in their lives. Then I think something like diet and um, what you put in your body does have a much bigger effect on someone who's maybe not naturally gifted or um, it's someone who it didn't happen to in a kind of more natural way, like like most of the the writers out there really have. Uh, come to the experience from a from a fairly gifted perspective. They've already had some form of experience um, spontaneously in most cases. My my personal experience happened from when I was, well, not with out-of-body experiences, but I had unusual experiences from around the age of five, and my out-of-body experiences started when I was around 12. So um, initially a few fleeting spontaneous experiences, and then I uh, developed them. Then I uh, basically worked systematically for six months before I was able to induce the experience intentionally. So that was kind of the process mm -hmm. with me. And I, I think that someone learning really needs to uh, think about the things that will give them an advantage. And I think that's true um, whether they're working with out body experiences or meditation or whatever it might be. Um, these are all just avenues uh, to develop and I think uh, the more you can um, create an environment for that to work, a context for that to work in the best way then, then the better. Really. Yeah. yeah, well it affects me now. Now I can just push through it. If I, uh, you know, um, if I get uh, some sugar or other things that cloud my mind, I can go on and push through it. It's not that it uh, you know, makes it impossible for me to function in a larger conscious system, it just makes it less efficient and less effective. Now I got to put a lot of effort into doing things that otherwise are effortless. So it uh, it just it still makes a difference. It's still easier if you have a uh, you know a clean system and you don't have these mind altering uh, substances going on at the same time as you're trying to do. Uh, you know you're you're trying to Work with your consciousness, and if your consciousness is 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 tripping or is you know foggy or something else, then you just have a foggy, trippy tool to work with, and that might be fun, but it doesn't take you very far as far as learning and growing from it. It's uh, you still have an experience, but it's not as coherent an experience. What I found, a lot of people use uh, use drugs. To get to the altered, you know, an altered state, to a larger consciousness uh, into the system, and indeed, I think that drugs will do that. The drugs can force you into that, into that state, can force you into an awareness in the larger consciousness system. But I don't think that it's as profitable a way to go than if you understand it to the point that you just are able to do it and control that experience, because then you're dependent on the drug. You can't do it, you know, without taking the drug. And the more you habituate yourself to that situation, the more true that gets to where you can't do it without the drug. Doing it without the drug becomes a lot more problematical. So in a way, you're kind of walking a, away from the, the ability to do it naturally. And when you do it naturally, you control it to a very fine degree. I couldn't have done research there if I you know, was taking drug trips to get there because the drug trips is is just an experience. You blast up and you have an experience and you come back and it's kind of wow, gee whiz. But that's not it. You can't do research that way. You can't really understand it. You can't grow from it that much. It's just a series of big experiences. Even if they are peak and wonderful experiences, it's just a series of experiences. 
And I, my, my analogy, it's like uh, going to the, the fair and getting on a roller coaster. Well, that's a big experience too. You know, you have that, that high drop and the speed and the sharp corners and it's really a big experience. And then when it's over, it's, it's over. And, uh, sure, you'll remember that roller coaster, but it's just an experience. And having the experience isn't the point. The point is the growing up that you do from having the experience. And the, um, Drugs don't seem to be as effective in that process as if you're doing it under your own steam. So I know some people who have done uh, it the drug way, and some of them like it a lot. Uh, my experience with, with people who have gone the drug route is that it's limited. They do have peak experiences, but their experiences are, and particularly if they do it a lot, their experiences eventually, uh, I don't know, are less profitable as time goes on. The most profitable thing about it is where they get the sense of, wow, there is a big reality out there. Oh, I see how everything's connected. Oh, I get the, you know, I get the big picture and I get how the whole thing works in an intuitive kind of way. And that's very valuable. But then after that, uh, you don't get a whole lot more than that. It's just uh, they get that in ten different ways, and as far as their growth goes, uh, not not so much. So it's I think it's a it's a valid way to get there, but I don't think it's a very effective way to grow up and to kind of explore. It's not a you know if, if the explorers of the past, if uh, you know uh, the ones that discovered lands that the Europeans didn't know about. If they just kind of got shot out into that land, spent a day, and then got shot back, you know, what would, you know, their explorations wouldn't have mattered to a whole lot. It just would have been a just a trip, an experience. It wouldn't really have made a map like you get to make if you go out and explore piece by piece. So sure, I, like you. I, I, I don't look down at the people who do that. I just think it's a very limited way to go. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think also it's a. I'm not sure. I'm convinced by the assumption that it's the same kind of environment, that it's the same kind of uh, experiential environment that you reach. Um, I have a feeling that um, it's it's quite different in many ways. There's often, especially with DMT, there's this talk that it's like a near death experience. But when I've looked at the uh, you know, the descriptions of those experiences, they seem very different to me. I, I don't really see them as as closely related. And then there's also the emotional impact that many people, when they take that step, it can have an emotional, psychological, uh, detrimental effect as well. So on a very, very pragmatic level, it, it, it's not always the best avenue. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I think that... Um, with with the experiences with, with uh, experiences in general, I'm not talking about drug experiences anymore. I, I mean, but um, some of the experiences can really um, help to redefine your your perspective of reality in a in a way that can be very challenging. For example, um, one of the ways that it's really changed me and opened me up was when I had precognitive experiences. One of my most significant experiences in my entire out-of-body experiences was um, a precognitive experience of a, of a bombing, a terrorist bombing that took place in London in 1999. This was a significant out-of-body experience because it was one of the most um, powerfully um, um, affecting in, in the sense of how it affected me emotionally and um, at, the, at the moment that it happened, but it was also extremely powerful in terms of the accuracy of the experience, the, the fact that I was able to um, go to another time frame, essentially, within the experience. I was standing on a street in central London. I saw an explosion burst out. I felt the emotional impact of the people who had been hurt in the, in the attack. Um, I saw the chaos and everything take place. And this all happened with four other people present while the out-body experience happened because it happened when I was teaching some some people I knew a, a technique. Um, so they actually brought me back 
out of the experience, they sort of coaxed me back out. And then I described to them what I'd seen. Um, and then it and then it took place five days after that experience. Um, so, so that really challenged everyone there in terms of their models and ideas of reality. And it also completely changed me in terms of up until that point, I didn't really even feel that something like precognition was possible. Um, so I think that that's an example of how something directly led me to look at a different way or a different model of reality and maybe led me to your work, led me to um, working with Dean Radin and with Michelle Drake and looking at these um, people who were directly researching the idea of how time might work within this larger reality and how um, how how this how this kind of experience could even be possible within that framework. So I, I think that's uh, that's an example of how something that can be a very literal experience or a very peak experience, as I would call it, um, how that can then have a direct impact on your learning and on your reality and on your your future development. Yeah, absolutely. That follows the, the uh, phrase I use often, which is, if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. And when it is your experience, then it is your truth. And there's no denying it and no saying, well, that really didn't happen, uh, you know. And I've had those things, too. I've had precognitive experiences and I've had other experiences that uh, kind of shocked me, if you will, into the realization that this larger consciousness system was a real thing with real information. And it wasn't a part of my imagination. It wasn't something, you know, it wasn't uh, any sort of mind games or psychological games or anything else. It was a real thing. And when you get that at a deep level, it's a very powerful changer of your, uh, of your life. You know, I was probably out at Monroe's for a couple of years, a lot of experience in out of body before I actually got to that point where it was not just in the intellect. I knew I was doing all these things. I knew I was collecting data that I shouldn't be able to, you know, collect. But until you have an experience like you, you described, it, uh, it, for me anyway, it, it uh, kind of remained intellectual. And then after a peak experience like that, it changes you. It's no longer just intellectual. It's at the very, you know, bottom level of your being. You know that this is real, that this is true. And now it's a matter of exploring it, seeing what else is, what else is out there. But I think people have to do that. And that's, that's, uh, that's the thing. Until you have that sort of experience, it's all hypothetical. After you have that kind of experience, it's not hypothetical anymore. It's, you know, you know you've gotten past that point of, of it being uh, a theory. Now it's an actuality and it's a matter of, of exploring it and understanding it. So do you, do you feel there is a um, an objective factor to it, or do you think that it's all relative to the individual's frame? Because sometimes you talk, um, you know, that's that's your reality, that's your um, you know your perception of it, and other times you sound more like you're saying that it's something that we can look at in an objective sense. So would you say it's more relative or more objective, or or it's both? <laughs> okay. Both. And the reason I say it's both is that you know, the data is real. The data is objective. It's real data you're getting. But once you get that data, it's your interpretation. So you get the data and you have to interpret it in terms of your own experience base, your own, you know, psychology, your own experience, your own uh, co concepts, your own fear. You, you uh, interpret the data in your own way, and that makes it very relevant. But the data you get is real data. That's objective data. But you turn it into your own experience. You see? So it's both. And the reason for that is, is that you never get to directly experience the source of the data. You only get to experience the data. So you are consciousness, and you get information, and then you interpret that information. But the source of the information is your interpretation. 
So if you're there and you're saying, well, I'm talking to this guy and he's got long white hair and pointy ears and this and that and he's from some other place, well, all of that description is yours. Well, let's put it this way, is tainted, is colored by what's yours. You see, you can't separate what's yours from what's not yours. So that's why I say it's it's relative, it's personal. On the other hand, there is something there that's giving you that data. You're not making up the the data stream. The data stream is objective. But what you make of it and how you deal with it, you can't help but color that with your own filters, with who you are and what and what you are and what your experience base is. So people who go out and who are very frightful find scary things. Uh, people who are not fearful don't find so many scary things. Uh, it's just how you interpret what you what you see. So it's both. The larger reality is there. It's an objective thing. Other entities are there. They are different than you. But your interaction with them and what you make of it and what you get, the pictures you get, the sounds, the smells, the whatever, those are things that are your best pattern match to the data you get. That's how we that's how we interpret things. If we get a if we get that information, we kind of do a pattern match to fit that in the context of our experience. How does it fit in our experience? And whatever you have in there is gives you the best pattern match, that's what you pull out. That may be accurate or it may not be accurate. So you know I say that when you read accounts of what people have seen out of body, you kind of have to read between the lines. Look at the big picture. The, the the significance of it, the meaningfulness of it, and that's probably the real stuff. The details of it, whether or not you know the monster had two heads or three heads, really isn't important. You see that it was a monster, that it was something scary for them. Now that was something real. They interpreted that whatever they saw that was scary, and that scare thing is a was the real thing. But the shape and form and type of it and that kind of thing gets interpreted. So I see it both ways. Yes, the, the bigger reality is a real thing. Uh, and yes, our experience of it is is uh, altered by our own experience base. And that's true in this reality. Everything that happens in this physical reality is the same way. You get data. The data comes through your senses. And then you take it and you do pattern match to try to fit it to some context within your experience. And you interpret it based on that, you know, that interpretation is your reality. It's not the thing itself. When you experience this physical reality, it's not the thing itself you're experiencing as reality. Your reality is your interpretation of what you experience. That is your reality. That's why five people standing in the same street corner seeing the same accident produce five different, you know, accident reports. They all see it differently. They all see a different accident because they all interpret what's going on. They notice different things. Different things are important or not important to them. Um, they have they have opinions from from prejudices and ideas and past experiences that all get mixed in there as well. And what comes out is something that's unique. So that works just the same in the larger reality as it does in this physical reality. We get data. We don't really get the source of the data. We get the light that reflected from the data, from the object, you see, and then we interpret what that light means. So it's we don't get to really experience the object. We experience our sense data of the object. And when we are in the, the non-physical, we just get the data, and we take that data, and we have to convert it back into our sense reference. So we smell it, we see it, we hear it, we convert it back into our physical senses because that's the only context we have for trying to understand what it is, is to put it into sense data. And our sense data doesn't necessarily cover all the things that you might experience in the non-physical. So we do our best pattern match and that's what we, that's what we get. And when you see and experience something in the non-physical that you just don't have any context for interpreting it, well, that's one of those things where you come back and you say, well, I really can't explain it. It, uh, uh, it was, 
you know, and you have a real hard time telling anybody about it because it just doesn't fit your your experience base, your, your pattern very well. So it becomes a very vague thing that you have a hard time dealing with. You've got the sense of it and the feel of it and the significance of it. Oh, yes, you got that very accurately. But trying to paint a picture of it is very difficult. So it's, yeah, I think it's just the nature of any reality that it's both objective and subjective at the same time. All experience is subjective. It's your own personal experience. But what you're experiencing has both subjective and objective components to it. So we have an imagination. Our imagination is one of the data sources. So we're out of body, and we see and hear and, and experience something. We can't tell the difference between what is really data that we add to it and the data that we get from it. So we dress that guy up in a robe and give him long white hair. Well, this being doesn't necessarily wear robes or have hair. You know, that's a physical thing, but that's what we give him because that's the way we interpret the data. So that's our imagination filling in for the context for our best pattern match for what it is we're experiencing. So our information and the and the objective information get all mixed up and only experience. And I know you appreciate that. Once you've once you've been there, you know, a hundred, two hundred, a thousand times, you get a lot better at that differentiation and you stop so much putting your own putting your own spin on everything, you just kind of take it as it is without having to dress the person, you know, tell what kind of haircut they have and what color it is and you know the the whether they have bone buttons or plastic buttons on their tunic, you know, you you let go of all of that stuff and you just do an interaction without all that adding the detail. The new people, they add all the detail. Everything has to be kind of physical like for them to grasp it in a form that they can talk about. Uh, eventually you let a lot of that go because you know it's just not relevant. What's relevant is the is the the content. Of the connection. What's the significance of it? All the rest of it's just wrapper, and a lot of that wrapper you create yourself. I I I agree with that um, to a point. I, I think uh, I think I'm interested in how far we can go towards that objective point. How far we can unravel the the overlay as you're talking about this kind of uh, psychological filler. Um, I think over time, the more I've done Zazen practice, for example, the more I've um, been able to strip away uh, the, the overlay factor. That's when the more veridical out-of-body experiences have, have come to the fore, um, even in terms of uh, on non-physical type levels, because, for example, I had a shared death experience with um, 140 people who died in a plane crash, and I witnessed the whole thing with no prior knowledge of the, the plane crash. I kind of saw them in what looked very much like the sort of afterlife environment that we generally hear about. Um, I know that's probably, as you say, this kind of interpretation, but I also don't want to assume that. I don't want to assume that these are interpretations because these are things that are constantly referenced across cultures and in, in different kinds of contexts. So I want to try and Pay attention to those details and try to refine down what what are the what are the objective factors of, of these experiences and what are the what are the uh, subjective factors? Is there a way to differentiate between these? Um, I, like my research at the moment is focused on the visual component of the out of body experience because for a long time in research, like the Aware study, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's just been done um, where they tried to gain evidence for um, veridical perception in near-death experiences. Uh, it was just assumed within that study that the visual component of the near-death experience is exactly the same as physical vision. Um, that's also often the case with any kind of research into out-of-body experiences. It's just assumed that visual perception is always the same. And I'm interested in the phenomenology. What exactly is taking place? What are the uh, visual components of these kinds of experiences. Is it all completely subjective to the individual or are there objective elements of these experiences and do they tell us something? For example, you're referencing this idea of the, the data coming in, the, the, the way that uh, in our physical senses the brain 
interprets the the photons hitting light receptors etc and creates this idea of the, the physical world out there through a sort of construction anyway we know that it's a it's a virtual reality even in our brains in that sense um but i'm wondering if when that information isn't coming through the senses when it's coming through the outbody experience or when it's coming through a psychic experience um are there factors that we can identify that maybe suggest how that process is working that can maybe lead us to a, a better model to understand how how that process is working how the physical brain might be connecting to this larger consciousness or um, where the bridge between those two um, realities is, is taking place but all of those things I think are still very much open questions and I think it's still really worth looking into that and, and for example I went through my out-of-body experiences and I identified all the different types of visual perception I'd experienced in those out-of-body experiences and I found that for example colors um, some experiences are very much like normal reality where you see with what seems to be the full uh, visible light spectrum in, in other experiences it seems to be more like um, pairs of colors from the visible light spectrum like you're seeing in just two colors from that spectrum like it's um, narrowed down uh, for example the precognitive experience that I just mentioned I saw in a in a blue gray everything was like I was, like I had a blue gray filter in front of my eyes um, now when when I've looked into that could that blue gray filter um, actually suggests something about how this vision is working so I compared this type of blue-gray vision to physical vision is there any relationship and I found that there's the idea of scotopic vision Sc scotopic vision being very low light vision when the cells of the eye have reduced down into um, just colors like dark green dark blue those kinds of colors so it does seem to have relationships to things that you could relate to the physical experience so maybe that information as it's coming in to the brain is then being interpreted by the brain as something that it's not i.e low light vision scotopic vision um, and then that's coloring or altering the way you experience uh, the outer body reality or the outer body data um, and I think these questions are really interesting and I think that's where my research is going that I'm trying to uncover if there if these can give us clues and if if it can give us clues to how the experience is unfolding why we experience the body why some people experience 360 vision why some people see in these two tone colors all of these kinds of things I think they will help to lead us towards understanding the mechanisms behind models like yours how we can bring the the experience itself together with with a model like uh the one that you've created does that make sense yeah no, i I've, I've kind of noticed in my own uh explorations that uh it depends mostly on what i'm focused on what's important as to how I get, you know, let's say the colors, I'm talking about colors. So if I'm just looking at a scene and I'm experiencing a place, then I'll get that in a full range of, of colors. Everything will be there to show me what's in that scene. If I'm looking at something like your experience, like the, the bombing, if there's some sort of thing like that, the only thing that's really important about that is what's happening. That the, it's the, the people, their reactions to it, the blast, you know, what's going on, where is it, uh, you know, this sort of thing. And when that happens, I don't get all the colors and I don't see the flowers that are growing in the park. I don't see, you know, the leaves on the tree. I don't get necessarily a whole lot of detail like I'm looking at it with physical eyes. I don't, you know, I don't actually, I'm not aware that I'm standing on grass and that the grass is light green or dark green. You know, all of that is just not important. So I don't process any of that. 
You know, I just process what's there. And in order to keep my focus on just what's important, I let the other things go. Now, having gone back to certain situations, different times, like you can go back to that time and you can re-see that same experience. It's still there for you to experience. You can go back and still see that and now it would be the past rather than the future. And if you re-experience it and get the same data, you can, if you wish, force your focus to take in the flowers in the park, the leaves on the trees, and other sorts of details. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, you'll focus on just a couple of details you'll pick out. You'll see, you know, some major action going on, and then zoom. You know, there's somebody in a red sweater, and, you know, you see that detail of that sweater right down to the yarn, you know, and the, and the little blue zigzags that are next to the yellow zigzags, and you get this real sharp detail of that, and then you back out. And then you'll find that later that that was an evidential fact that you were going to see. You'll see that guy with that shirt on when you watch the newscast the next, you know, the next week. You'll see that, and that will be evidential. And that's why you zoomed in and picked that out, whereas you didn't really notice what anybody else was wearing. That just kind of, they were just people, and they were just there, and you just pick up the details. So I found that all of that is a variable. You get as much information as as you focus on, and if you're being given, as you were given this this precognitive dream, you were just given what happened, what it was, the nature of it, the feel of it, the the energy of it, and the impact of it. You got all that. That's what was important. Color and the details weren't important. That wasn't part of it. It wasn't worth processing. It wasn't, uh, you know, so with our vision, now physical vision, you get out every time I look out the window, you know, I see the grass growing, I see all the different blades of grass, I see the trees, I see the texture in the bark, I see, you know, all the different leaves. I see all that stuff almost all the time I look out the window. On the other hand, when, uh, you know, when I, I have a lot of animals walking around in my yard, I live in the woods, so, uh, you know, when the deer are walking through my yard, I kind of focus in on them, and I don't pay too much attention to the surroundings then. If there are birds in the trees, I kind of don't notice them anymore. So we, we have this ability to focus on what we want to focus on. And when you're given, particularly when something's given to you like that vision, it often isn't given to you with all the detail. It's given to you with just what it is you need to know. So you're only focusing on the important part, on the content. So you can go back those things and see them in different ways, experience the same thing, force the focus to do, to look at something else. And it's, the information is there. It's just you're not, you don't process it. Now, of course, I don't see, you know, a physical brain. I see a virtual brain. And the consciousness is really the thing. And the consciousness doesn't live in the brain. The consciousness is outside of that virtual reality. So the consciousness works the same way in all cases. When the consciousness gets data from the physical reality, it interprets the data. And if it wants to see more detail, it can focus on detail, or less, it can focus on less. Uh, and when it's in the when it's experiencing in the non-physical, it's the same way. So an awful lot of what you see is has to do with what you're interested in, what's important to you. Um, What's not important to you? You don't want stuff that's distracting. You want to you want to focus in on the main thing. So I don't pay too much attention to what I see anymore, as I do to what the message is. What's the content? What's the purpose or the point of it? And kind of go right to that and let the details kind of be whatever they are. I don't really pay a whole lot of I, attention. To yeah, I, I guess I'm interested in both because I, I, I guess um, I don't know if that's the case that, you know, the, the blue-gray filtering was was for that reason, for example, because when it's happened on other occasions, um, the detail has been very uh, striking on all levels other than for this blue-gray filtering. So it seems... It seems kind of hard to say that this was um, because it wasn't important. That all that was important was the was the factor of what was happening. Um, I, I guess for me, I, I just uh, I'm still in this phase that I, I think that we need to to remember that 
who don't have all the answers yet. I think that yeah. it's, yeah, I, I, really... I still think that we need to unravel a lot of this stuff. And, and I, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if I'm at a point that I would want to ignore the, those, those elements yeah. because I think they no, might, they, yeah, well, I, I think they might hold some real important keys to, to what's going on. Um, right, you shouldn't ignore them. You should study them and you should, uh, you know, put, you know, as much detail out of that as you can. I think it is a good thing to do. Um, you may also find, you know, that there's other things that you will develop as you go as tools. Now, I'm not saying that this blue-gray is one of your tools, but I'm saying things like that are developed as tools. So you will associate perhaps a certain kind of content or experience with certain colors or with certain structures or with certain ways that you approach it. And sure, that sure, I, I understand that. That becomes, but... a tool for you. that becomes a tool for you. So whenever you see blue-gray, that means this. All right. That's like whenever you get sure, the pulsation. Sure, sure. But, today, but, means... but the point the point is is I'm also looking at the experiences of other people. I'm not just talking about myself sure. here. I'm saying that right. there are these characteristics like 360 vision, like uh, tunnels, like um, certain color gradients that happen across mm -hmm. hundreds, thousands of people that I that I've worked with. So I'm not just talking about a particular characteristic of my experience. I'm talking about characteristics that are apparent in many, many people's experiences. And I think they might be more significant than just a, a kind of uh, a framework that my own consciousness is using to communicate with me. I think that they might sure. be more fundamental or more, more uh, important than that. Yeah, they okay. could be. And, uh, you know, you never know, right? That's why you're doing the research is to find these things out. But exactly. uh, they certainly could, they could be that. Um, they could be also just, uh, you know, sort of like Jungian archetypes that people, even in different cultures, kind of see things the same way. We're all part of the same physical reality experience here. And that's what drives how we interpret. So we all have things kind of in common, the way we see things and the way we interpret things because we live in a, a similar world. Uh, you should expect uh, similar cultures to be even more similar in the things they see. Different cultures, a little different, but still, physical reality is physical reality, whatever your culture, and some of the things are going to be the same. So like human archetypes as opposed to uh, cultural archetypes, and there may be some of that in there too. But all of these are variables that you'll have to try to separate and see, you know, what's this effect and how do these correlate, and you're doing it right. You know, you should have no opinions. As to what the final, you know, answer is, you should just collect the data and see where it seems to fall and what makes sense to you. And that's, well, that's how that's science exactly, is done. Exactly, that's exactly the perspective I'm going from a yes. from a more bottom up perspective, I would say, um, yeah. from the grassroots up. <laughs> right. Well, that's how good science is done. That's the way you have to do it. Yeah, you know, it's the it's the right it's the right approach. I agree. Actually, we even go further than that. I say it's the only approach. If you do it any other way, you'll just, uh, you know, work yourself into believe whatever your bias is. <laughs> you have to do it. You have to do it that way. You just collect it and see what makes sense to you. Yeah, I, I think, um, and I think it's it's very important because no one's really done this kind of work within the OBE field or within a lot of the consciousness research in general, there hasn't been this, you know, real aim to, to sort of uncover this kind of detail and to, to look at the, the elements of an experience like an OBE in that kind of way across many, many individuals. Obviously, people talk about their own experiences and then sort of take their own experiences to be factually true for everyone. And uh, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to look at the context across many, many different people. That's good. Well, that's what you do. You look for the commonality. What are the, what are the threads? What are the, you know, what correlates with what? And uh, yeah, it hasn't been done. And it hasn't been done primarily if there are not that many people who uh, have the ability to do that kind of 
of research because it takes it takes repetition. You have to do the same sorts of things many times, changing one variable at a time, and you have to talk to a whole lot of other people and see what you know what how their our experiences connect with your experiences and what are the common points in them and what are the differences and why are the differences like that. And yes, I did an awful lot of that as well. That's just the nature of what you have to go through. You got to do all of that. And uh, I don't do it so much anymore because I'm more focused on content than I am on process or uh, you know what the what it what it looks like or the color that it is. It's just basically and it's more content to me anymore because that's where I found the is the real is the real value. But that doesn't mean that there isn't real value in understanding those other things. It's just not a path that I particularly you know gravitated toward. I, I, and, uh, I think I think it's kind of there's a there's a value in a person like in the personal context and in my own journey I put a lot of value on the symbolic meanings, on the on the kind of uh, the interpretation that I might be making of a particular experience and the spiritual journey that it takes me on. The, as we as we started talking about right at the beginning, this idea of how the whole experience just naturally opens you up in the spiritual context. You don't have to think about it particularly. You don't have to be even conscious of it. It just takes place because that experience directly changes you. You can't avoid that. And I think that... I'm constantly with my own journey kind of looking at that. But I guess within the, the wider scientific context of our greater understanding of what's taking place, I think we have to go right down to the to the basics, you know. And I think in many ways the basics have been stepped over and, and are not engaged with. And I think that I'm trying to bring together this, you know, beauty and transformative nature of the experience with the the mechanics and the and the practicalities and how can we give this experience to people? How can the people who've never had this kind of experience, how can the technology, how can the science, how can all of these things allow people, help people to, to make that step and to go on that journey for themselves? I think that's kind of the ultimate goal with me. It's, it's kind of bridging these areas, bringing them together. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. I think you're right on the mark. And uh, it's going to be very, uh, very useful, very helpful to a lot of people. And, uh, the, the people out there should be very uh, understand. They're very lucky to have you doing that sort of thing. It's a, it's a very valuable uh, process. That was our original start uh, back in Monroe's. Is how can you, how can we make this available to other people? Because until there's a lot of people who have the experience. It's always off in the it's off in the margin. It doesn't uh, you know, it doesn't compute. It's just a goofy thing that goofy people do. But if hundreds of thousands, if hundreds of millions of people have this awareness, then not only will we live in a happier place because they will also be on a spiritual journey, whether they intend to or not. But uh, they will have a bigger picture, and with a bigger picture comes a a broader understanding and less less self centeredness. So it all just kind of works together. So the idea of making it more available to a larger number of people is a very good idea. It's uh, it's a very uh, important idea to to do that. And as much as you can understand the details of what's going on and why it's going on, then that's good too, because that gives these other people some structure with which they can process this information. In. Because if there's no structure, then people have a hard time grabbing hold of it. So we give them tools, we give them processes, we give them structure so that they can, they can, you know, they can process the data. And it's important to do that. And everybody's different. One group of people, what they need is something totally different than another group of people. You know, it's not one size fits all as far as getting people to be able to have this experience. Uh, some people you could work with one on one for a year and they never have an experience because they're just not ready for that yet. Other people go very quickly and uh, having these little um, cells, if you will, or bubbles of expertise that are that are helping this process, helping other people to experience it, I think is just terrific. It's a good it's a good thing and 
it would be better if there were uh, you know a hundred more of you out there uh, doing this uh, this process all over the place. It's a it's a, it's a very valuable process to to. Uh, to well, do. sure. We need we need more of both of us. We need more of uh, the people looking at things in a more objective way and um, trying to trying to unravel what's going on. Yeah, so uh, I think that's probably a good place to to end on, um, bringing it back to this sort of spiritual journey that we, we began on. Yeah, well, that's really what it's all about. That is the that is the fundamental thing from my viewpoint. That's really the the uh, the key here. The rest of it are kind of details. Not that the details are unimportant, but the rest of it is kind of the details of it. People can get on that spiritual journey through other paths. They don't have to, to do this direct experiential path. But this is a good path, particularly in the West, where we are so left brain dominant that we need process and tools in order to get there. It um, don't necessarily need that in an Eastern in an Eastern culture as much, although the Eastern cultures are turning into Western cultures very quickly. They, uh, yeah. For the sake of the, uh, the conversation, there's one thing that, Tom, you said, uh, but you didn't elaborate. I don't want to keep you long, but I think it's kind of important to the work that you guys are doing and all of us are doing. And that is, you said, well, you can go back to it and look at it again, but you never elaborate it. No, that would have been a long story. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't yeah. time for that sort of elaboration. It's it's data, and for the most part, every all the data is is saved. So you can go back, and it might not be identical, but it's going to be very close. All the you know some of the detail may be missing, but you can re-experience things. You just can go back to that state and and basically rerun that that piece of reality and experience it again, and then you you can modify it. So, you know, if you're just looking at a motion picture and you rerun the motion picture, you get exactly the same thing that you saw the first time because it's a motion picture. It's just the way it is. You can't change the colors. You can't bring up this detail and suppress that detail in the motion picture. It just is. This isn't a motion picture. This is data that you are interpreting, and you can interpret it differently another time. You can look at it differently, and but, the data but, still... But really? I mean... Those really life-changing, totally, yeah. totally kind of beyond your comprehension type experiences. You feel that you can, I, for, for example, if I felt right here now that I tried to access that, I feel like I would just access some kind of imaginary sort of replication of, of that experience. I, I don't yeah. feel like I don't feel like I could just choose to reaccess those really really peak fundamental transformative experiences they they just happen when they happen yeah, but you can they're there you can if you uh, want to do that you can actually redo it now you can just run a memory you know you can just run it in your memory too that's something you also can do but you can do those that's different though isn't that it? experience again and actually have that repeated you just have to have that intent when you uh they're in the state, and you can replay it, and you can modify it to some extent. Now, right, the right. reason for getting it would be different. I know Gary mentioned there I should have talked about why would anybody get that, that precogning experience. Well, the reason is obvious. You know, the reason was for exactly what it did for you. It changed your life. It made a big impact. It suddenly all of this was real. Uh, you know, it, it went from hypothesis to fact, and it made a huge difference. That's why you were given that that uh, experience. It was it was meant for you because it's something you needed to set you off on the path that you needed to be on. So that's why that that's why you get those kinds of experiences. But it's still it's still there, and you can get it, and it's still as fresh. And when you get it that way, the emotions still work the same way. You'll still see you know you'll still feel. A lot of the same things. 
I think I agree with you in terms of what what its meaning was and what its purpose was. I, I feel that these types of experiences do have that kind of effect, but I, I'm, I, I will remain skeptical about whether it's possible to truly reaccess that, that level of fundamental experience Graham. because they're so Graham. rare and so... Yes. Graham, yeah. what Tom is referring to is what the ancients call the Akashic Records which he calls the database. Sure, I'm familiar with the Akashic Records, but that, that's that's something uh, different again. And and like I was describing, I, I think I can I could access a kind of reflection of it, a shadow of that experience, if you like. But I don't feel like I could intentionally right now just reaccess the the yeah. fundamental kind of core of that experience. Not not without I don't know some major major shift taking place which uh i don't know i mean i'll try it i've never met anyone else who claims that tom but um <laughs> well, i have tried it i, ha I have tr i have tried to react to mm -hmm. kinds of levels and um I, I you know i i just uh i think they're fundamental and transformative for a reason i think that um they're you know they are when all of these peak elements are together to put it in a very pragmatic sense i think that they only take place when kind of like when every element is in sync if you like so it, it would be like um i think That's like true, it, right? like a sport yeah i can say i can say theoretically i could run that race and break the world record again let's say that i was a champion sprinter i know that theoretically i could do that but whether i ever will you know as that person who's that champion athlete is is another is another thing and you know i, I for example there is that context that it's often when all of those things are in play when all of that emotion all of that that whole situation is in play that that person will achieve something exceptional like the woman who lifts the car to save her child or or whatever these absolutely fundamental experiences that people have and I I, I haven't I, I'm just a bit I'm not saying it's impossible because I don't say anything's impossible but I, I just find the the idea a little bit it sounds a bit too good to be true that, that, that it's so easy yeah you can re-experience it but when you do re-experience it you can do it in two ways you can re-experience it as you were then and you can re-experience it as you are now and you have you can that's another thing you can do with your intent so you can you can kind of rehab the experience which is just probably uh very much what you did if you just used your memory that's a replay of your experience right down to the detail um or you can see it again but from the person that you are now and it, either one's possible you're not limited to uh just one part of it but yeah you know in a, in, a, in a digital system almost anything is possible it's um it's amazing the amount of flexibility that there is in the system if you think of the system as an analog system that comes and goes and doesn't ever repeat then it seems impossible but in a digital system almost everything is possible in, a, in an information system almost everything is possible in theory in theory yes <laughs> but is this a matter of uh, practice to uh, make that theory a reality mm. yes but hey remain skeptical and open-minded that's the only way to go you you uh, anything else doesn't work it's uh you know you've got to get there from a skeptical position and if you don't get there from a skeptical position you won't learn what you need to learn in the process of getting there. So it's absolutely essential to be wherever it is you are and wherever steps you're going in whatever direction, you stay skeptical and make the facts talk to you and see the, see the connections. And that's the way you're going and there isn't any other way to go. So I could see that in your book when I was looking at your book to see whether well is this something i really wanted to endorse or not 
and you seem to have that attitude, and that was good. That uh, was probably the main reason that I thought it would be a good book to endorse, because you do have that attitude. So remaining skeptical is the right thing, the only thing. I don't think you like the first book, do. though. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, don't know about that. I just looked at I, the second I did, one. And I, send you, I did send you both of them, actually. Um, but the, 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 the first one was more my own journey and, and the, and the spiritual insights that the, that the experiences have given me. So I guess it was more looking at that whole philosophy and nonviolence and attitudes of uh, self transformation and change and how it applies in, in the physical life, you know, because of the, the violence and the situations I experienced growing up in in london there's a a strong social aspect in me as well because of the the context of the environment i grew up in in um in a very working class poor environment in london so that is talked about in the book i talk about how violence that i experienced actually eventually led me to a non-violent attitude so i think that um that's also quite important in the in the sort of spiritual journey that I describe in the first book, um, which has nothing to do with OBEs. I mean, the, the first book is only partly about OBEs. It, it includes a whole range of visionary type experiences and also very physical social experiences like what I just described. So I think that all of it all ties in, and I think that's what I was trying to get at um in the first book this whole idea that all of this leads to this kind of non-violent attitude which is essentially uh, an idea of the golden rule the the idea of do unto others the and ultimately i guess you would say uh, love or or seeing in others yourself reflected essentially so i think the the book goes through all of that up to the, that final kind of point and also then very it also describes a very subtle shift that I experienced in in Sardinia um, where I went on a on a holiday and I essentially um, by a series of unfortunate occurrences I couldn't get access to my bank account and I only had 200 euros on me so I basically had to um, pay for everything and live on virtually no money for for 10 days while i was on this holiday so this holiday by chance turned into essentially a spiritual retreat and i i i practiced zazen every day and one day when just laying there i had this moment where it just felt like a very subtle shift there were no lights no bells no fanciness or you know uh visual element to it or anything like that it was just this very subtle moment this shift between literally one moment and the next moment and but everything sort of changed in my in my understanding and my worldview and led me to actually write the first book and also to um start working with uh anti-poverty charities and things like that so and also become vegan, so I don't uh, support uh, violence towards other beings and things like that as well. So it was a a whole shift in my in my reality. Yes, you know, you you interpret the reality through the lens of your experience, and as your experience changes, the way you interpret reality changes. And then as you change more, you know, the way you see things changes. You get to a point where you're ready to see things differently and if you just give it a moment like sit down and be quiet and let your ego get out of the way for a moment then you have you can have these experiences where everything just kind of falls into a different shape and a different space and then you no longer see the world the way you used to see the world your interpretations are different so it's a it's a, just a constant process of evolving ourselves and our quality and when you get you know it's a series of steps, so you you can't get to step C until you've been to step B, you know, and it's uh, like that for everybody. So you interpreted first your pro your your things in terms of uh, you know the background that you had, the violence, the, the, the hard 
darn place you grew up in. And then you saw that, well, that was just a, a piece of it. That's not, that's not fundamental. You know, it's just a piece you experienced. And then your, your reality got bigger and got bigger. And as it gets bigger, your interpretation changes. And now even that hard part that you were in initially, you would interpret that different today. It would be a, I mean, it's still there, and it's still like that for the people there, but it doesn't affect you like it would have affected you before because you're not the same person anymore. So it's just an evolution of the way we see things and uh, what, they, what they mean to us. And as long as you're open and as long as you're skeptical, this just process just keeps on going. You know, you just keep evolving, uh, and uh, your viewpoint just gets bigger and bigger. That's the That's the beauty of it. That's what's really so nice about going off on one of these, uh, uh, I don't know, spiritual adventures that I call life. You know, that's what life is. It's really a spiritual adventure. A lot of people don't know that that's what it is that they're on, but uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing here. I, too, am vegan, uh, and I agree with you on that. You know, there's no killing things because they taste good. It's not moral. You know, you, uh, it's not a good thing to do. Which is interesting, you see, because here we come from two different environments altogether, two different processes. You know, I'm coming out as a physicist, you know, who goes to work with Bob Monroe, and you're coming out of a hard place in London, and we both start having out of bodies. You know, I started at around five years old or so, five, six, you know, in that neighborhood as well. And oh, um, you, oh, you did, okay. Yeah, so we we end up in. We end up in uh, very similar places, you know. It's not a, it's not a, just a random chance that we both turn out to be vegan. It's a, uh, it's, it's we, are, we are, we are evolving in, you know, in similar directions because that is the forward pointing direction of evolution. That's where we're going. You know, it's not a random event, and we're seeing it as a spiritual journey because that's what it is, and it's. So, so people all over getting there on their own path in their own way, and they interpret where they've been and where they are and where they're going through their own lens. And that's the way it should be, because one person's interpretation is not a is not doesn't work for everybody. You know, we need sure. thousands, hundreds of thousands of of people doing this, giving their own interpretation, because every different interpretation and every different path that's been progressed through all has something unique to give to you know, the world. And there are people that will resonate with one path and not another. So it's, it's there can't be too many of us. There can't be too many people on a spiritual journey. You know? And we, we're all headed the same direction now. So that's, you know, it's neat that way. You know, I, I see a lot of really neat people in the workshops and things that I give. Lots and lots of very very uh, grown people show up there, and it just gets very obvious after a while that you see the direction. You know that is the direction of evolution. That's the way people are when they grow up. They they are concerned about killing things because they taste good. You know that doesn't seem to like a good idea anymore. You know it, uh, it's just kind of the it's, it's the, the direction of of uh, progress. So it's good. Our differences are good. Yeah, sure, <laughs> you know, as you, you look at things, it's not that you're right and I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong. That's silly. That has nothing to do with it. There's no right or wrong to it. We're on different paths, doing different things, you know, appealing to different people. And oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see us as that different. No, I don't I, I, I see us doing this. I see I'm. I'm coming, I'm trying to look at it from the grassroots up and you as a physicist have created a model of the, of the larger system. And right. I'm, I'm, you know, so we're kind of, uh, you know, converging in the middle. I, I kind of feel like it's just two, two different roads that lead to the same point. Um, exactly. You know, exactly. And I, I mean, my, my model. won't see that. Oh, okay. Well, my my model on you know in terms of how I think it probably probably is is very much uh, in tune with how 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 you were describing it. I I, I may be just a bit more like uh, 
I think we don't know. I'm a bit more like, I like to say, I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know what the, 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 the truth of it is. You know, I may never know. I might work it out. Um, but my, my model is always evolving. It's always changing. It's, it's, uh, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know if anyone will ever work it out fully. So that's kind of my, my angle. Maybe they will, I, but, uh, but, uh, I, I still very much, uh, I like to look at it like the beginner's mind, though, Shen, you know, this idea of, uh, look at everything as if you're learning it for the first time. Um, and I try to apply that even with things that I feel very ingrained, um, as true. And I, I like to keep sort of unraveling them and saying, okay, well, maybe they're not true. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I have the same attitude. My uh, models have also evolved, and they continue to evolve. You know, the things I talk about today are not the things I talked about two, three years ago. And it's constantly changing and growing, and things fall into place, and logical consequences fall out. And as it does, you pick up those pieces and put them in the puzzle and keep on going. I don't see any end to it either. It's, uh, you know, it's a it's a lifetime process this growing up, this evolving and becoming and understanding the bigger picture. I don't really see that, that uh, oh, now, you know, it's it's done. I, I know everything, you know. I, I think that's <laughs> that's kind of a, you know, a, a, a silly place to, to think that you're going to some place where you know everything. You know, that's not it. You know, models are just models. Models have to be flexible. They're not, uh, you know, we don't call them laws or facts their models well and reality way, is probably flexible too so yes yeah well it's been fun it's been fun i guess we could just go on for a long time we have a lot in common but uh it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun graham yeah it has i don't know if are we still recording i'm not sure <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I, I stopped when you when we ended the formal part. Oh, we thought, okay. <laughs> well, I, well, we all enjoyed it just the same. This was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry for being a half an hour late, but it just took me a long yes. time to recover. And, now and i got to go down the road. figure that problem out. Yeah, down the road, do a follow-up. This was wonderful. This was really great. <laughs> The unrecorded part was great. <laughs> <laughs> never, Oliver, never turn the recording off. You can always delete it later. You know? Yeah, actually, I, I can uh, kind of, I have to edit something in the, in the way the recording is done, but I can actually, I can recover it. So if we you want to. It, yes, because as I was watching you guys, I was thinking, okay, I can edit this out and I can, I can do this. This can, this will, okay, yeah, this is good. This is good. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Well, Okay, I'll make sure that the last part is uh, also on the recording then. Okay. okay. Well, thank you both. Take yeah, care. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Tom.